Thank you so much. It's such a thrill for me to be here because uh, this is probably my favorite part of the world. My grandfather's from County Kildare. I just found that out the other day. I've been telling people all my life that he was from County Cork and uh, shows you how up on this I am. But I'm determined to find my, uh, my ancestry at some point. But anyway, I've always loved um, working with songwriters. Now, there's that kind of funny sound like a phone getting a phone call. Is that a, is that a phone on? Because uh, when it comes in, it goes, eh, 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 eh. I don't, well, let me just turn mine off. It's so awesome. <laughs> I don't get calls on this phone, though. Um, all right. Anyway, um, the first time I was ever asked to teach, and, and But when I say teach, I don't mean to sound like I'm above you guys and I'm looking down on my little, little students. Especially, you know, when I take into consideration some of the songs that I've heard uh, sent to me. Um, I feel like I'm among my peers, but I think we can all learn from each other. And, uh, you know, when I was first asked, though, to teach, I was asked to go to Berkeley in Boston, which is a big, huge music school, Berkeley School of Music. And... I had never taught before, and um, they asked me if I would come and do a residency, and of course I said, sure, you know, <laughs> and then I thought, I don't know how to teach, how to write. I don't know how I write songs, I don't know, but I'll wing it, you know, and Pat Patterson, who I, I believe has come here and spoken before, he had written a, a chapter in his book on lyric writing where he took apart one of my songs, actually took two of them apart, and he had sent it to me ahead of time, and uh, I didn't really get a chance to read it till I was on the plane, and he took this song apart and just butterflied it, you know. And he explained how I did this and how I did that and why the chorus was relit because of the thing and the automatopoeia and the fourth power to the pi over the fourth power minus seven. And, you know, all these big words, college -y words, but, you know, I actually had forgotten to go to college because I got a publishing deal right around that time. And anyway... Uh, I was breaking out in a cold sweat on the airplane because I was way above my pay grade. <laughs> and I was just getting ready to walk into a situation where I was going to have to wing it for three days of teaching. I read the chapter, and I couldn't even understand what all I did in that song. I was so impressed with myself, I could hardly be with me. <laughs> I was so like, I can't believe I'm who I am, right, that I did that. Only I didn't do that. I didn't actually do any of that. But there it was. I made up this song, and all that was happening in the song. All this stuff was happening in the song that you could see it. You could, he pointed to this and that points to that. And, and I was completely stunned as to how to walk into that situation and be of any use to anyone because I felt like sort of an idiot savant, you know, like, I don't know, I just wrote it down, you know. And so I walked in, and right away I was, you know, very moved by, they were young people from all over the place, some had won scholarships and they were sitting there and they were, they'd been studying Beth Nielsen Chapman for three or four days before I got there and they were like waiting for me to tell them how I did it. And I realized pretty much as I went along that the, the best thing that I could offer them was the truth. And, and since then I've learned a lot more about how to teach and how to talk about the creative process. It's incredibly important on the front end of being creative or coming up with something to have a lot of freedom for mushiness and things don't have to be perfect yet. And if you have one of those intellectual brains like I do that wants to come along and name everything and fix everything and what's this going to be called and who's going to cut it, how are we going to get it, da, 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 da. you got to get that part of your mind quieted down because the good stuff comes from the roots of something that comes from a place that's not your brain. It comes from a tone or it comes from a wisp of something so deep in your soul, so deep in your heart and your memory that you write a line, if you're Paul Simon, you'll write a line like, she wore diamonds in the soles of her shoes. And everybody goes, wow. So those kind of lines you don't think up. And I wanted to get these kids at this college who were deeply learning so much about the technique and all of this stuff about the analytical process of um, editing and, and positioning your song to be rewritten. 
which is a completely important thing to learn. It's a very, very essential part of becoming a really good songwriter. And there's a lot of different ways to learn it. There's a lot of great books on it. Jimmy Webb has a great book. Pat Patterson has a lot of great books on it. Uh, but if you don't have the clay if you have a high quality that comes out, the, the thing that you started with, the, the inspiration, if that's not something that has some life in it, then you're just sort of moving furniture around, really. And I know that when I write, I particularly will come from the melody most of the time. I, I hear tones in the melody. I might hear a vowel in the melody. And then I'll sort of stumble on a word, and then I'll stumble on a line, and I'll think, well, that kind of sounds like I said such and such. And then I'll, I grow it almost from a subliminal place. And th you, that's just one way to do it. There's a lot of ways to do it. But, and I sat there with these kids, and I s just walked up to the microphone, and I said, I want to make a full confession. I know you've read the chapter in the book on, on how I wrote that song, and um, I want you to know that the entire time that song was coming into being, I was writing it, but I did not know what I was doing. I did not know I, what that word was. I did not know what that was. I didn't know that it was doing this, 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 this. And the two little girls in the front row just started sobbing with relief because they were so happy that they didn't have to know all that. God forbid if I'd had to know all that, I'd never written a song. That said, I'm so happy that Pat did that. And, I'm, and I love the way he teaches, and I love how he pulls people into a place of really having a good knowledge about the workings of a song because that will never hurt you to know. I'm not one of those people that thinks that if you learn to read music, you won't be able to write as creatively. I don't believe that. Now, I didn't learn to read music, but I think if I had learned to read music, I'd even be that much better of a songwriter. Because the thing that I'm talking about, anybody can do, even if you're a super learned person, I'm talking about walking out to the edge of what you know and hanging one foot over into what you don't know when you start especially. Now that doesn't mean that you can't just come up with a great title or some sort of wisp of an inspiration and build it from there and use your brain. It's just that you don't want your brain driving the car. You want the creative spirit driving the car. And you want your ego brain person that's going to go accept the Grammy part of you <laughs> sitting in the passenger seat with duct tape on its mouth for the first part of the journey because you really don't need to be too nailed down and you can put your fear in the glove compartment and you can have the whiner in the back seat, the, you know, the one that wants to go have a cup of tea. I've been working, oh, 15 minutes. I should go have a break. So all these parts of me exist in the process of writing a song. And I've learned over the years to get better and better at sort of balancing them out. But the fundamental thing for me is always just the fun, childlike part at the beginning. And if you give yourself permission to start that way, and even just do it as an exercise. That might feel uncomfortable to you. You might think, what is she talking about? But just noodle. Just, tr just try to noodle your way into writing a song sometime. Uh, you know, especially in, if you're co-writing, people want it more grounded. They're like, what are we going to write about today? That's the brain talking. Whereas opposed to just... So That just came out of the thin air. And I mean, I might record that and go back and go, eh, or I might record that and listen to it two days later and go, wow, I like that. I'm going to build from there. So anybody do that? Anybody in here do that when they write? A lot of you guys do. Okay, I'm preaching to the choir. All right, well, I'm going to start off with a song that I wrote that's been a big hit, not to scare you, but because uh, I love playing it. It put my son through college. My third of it put my son through college. I wrote it with Annie Roboff and Robin Lerner. And um, typical, two years before it got cut, it was written. People would think, we thought when we fi finished this song that it was a smash. Well, it ended up being a smash, but, you know, we took it out there and just said, hey, here it is, and then nobody cut it for like two years. And then one of the things, one of the elements was that we had done this sort of R&B demo. It was almost like Patti LaBelle, you know kind of thing. We thought it was a pop song. And if you structurally looked at it, it is a pop song. And then we found out that Faith Hill was cutting. 
And so Annie, uh, who's a wonderful producer, she's, she went in the studio and said, let's put it, let's move it from keyboards to guitars. Get rid of the drum machines. Let's get a real drummer. Let's make a more of a country demo. And that afternoon, Faith cut it pretty much. It was barely out of, <laughs> the tape was barely dry. So uh, anyway, it goes like this. I don't want another heartbreak I don't need another turn to cry No, I don't want to learn the hard way Baby, hello, oh no, goodbye But you got me like a rocket Shooting straight across the sky It's the way you love me It's a feeling like this It's centrifugal motion It's perpetual bliss It's that pivotal moment It's impossible This is, this is Unstoppable This is, this is Cinderella said to Snow White How does love get so off course? So all I wanted was a white knight With a good heart, soft touch Fast horse, ride me off into the sunset. Baby, I'm forever yours. It's the way you love me. It's a feeling like this. It's centrifugal motion. It's perpetual bliss. It's that pivotal moment. It's ah, subliminal. This kiss, this kiss. It's Kiss me in the moonlight on a rooftop under the sky. Oh, you can kiss me with the windows open while the rain comes blowing inside. Oh, kiss me in sweet slow motion. Let's let everything slide. You got me floating. You got me flying. It's the way, the way you love. Now, I guess that's probably my biggest hit, uh, but I've had other kinds of hits, and, and one of the things I like to balance out, because you want to be a songwriter, you want to write from your soul, you want to write from your heart, and there's a lot of heart and soul in that song, even though you, you know, somebody could call it an up-tempo positive little ditty about love. Um, but it also came from that childlike place, you know, when we got together to write it, uh, we were trying to write the second verse, and just an example of how this amazing, powerful flow is available um, to anyone who tunes into it. Um, and often the creative spirit won't be all that specific. It's like it trusts you to figure it out. And it's got a whole lot of other stuff to do, like grow all the trees and the grass and, you know, all the babies that have to be born. So creativity is really busy. So, you know, it's going to assume that you're going to figure it out. So if you take something that falls through your head that doesn't sound that great, it doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't have anything in it. It just means you have to look for the key or the clue. Sometimes. Sometimes it's just crap. But sometimes there's a clue. And I'm a real believer in, I record every single second that I'm writing, even if I'm just saying, you know, pick up the phone or something. So when we got, we just kept, you know, we, we had the first verse in the chorus of that song, and we felt like it was really good. And we needed, to, that second verse is always tough, isn't it? The, just the hardest part, the second verse. Because if you've done a really good job with the first verse and the chorus, assuming it's that structure, then you've said the whole song. And now you have to say something new. But it has to be something that relates to the song. But it has to be new. And it has to move forward. And then you have to be able to come back to that chorus. So we just blurt things out. So I'd be like, <laughs> so we go like this. 
Cleopatra was a snowflake that fell out of my mouth. You know, Cleopatra was a snowflake, and, uh, do, 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 do. and I'm like, Cleopatra was a snowflake. And Annie's going, you are not putting Cleopatra in this song. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 it's not Cleopatra. It's no, so somebody else. It's like, a, it's like, what? Why would I say Cleopatra was a snowflake? Why would I say that? And see, that's the difference between one songwriter and another. If I had just said, yeah, that sucks, I would never say Cleopatra was a snowflake. Are you kidding? Of course I wouldn't say that. On to the next thing. But the song was trying to tell me something. And they were all laughing at me and, you know, like, let's go get a sandwich. Beth needs a break. She's working too hard, you know. And I was like, and when they came back, I was like, no, here it is. Cinderella said to Snow White, how does love get so off course? Oh, all I wanted was a white knight with a good heart, soft touch, fast horse. And that was this iconic conversation between these two, you know, iconic female characters, you know. I still had to sell Robin on that. She did not want cartoon characters in the song, but I think it ended up making the song really work, you know, and playful, and of course we all agreed with everything as it went up the charts. We were all like, yep, that was good. <laughs> so, um, but I want to talk to you about this creative spirit, and I am going to not talk very long because I want to get to critique as many of, song, of your songs as I can. I know there were um, way more than I could do in the period of time that we have, so I'm going to try to be streamlined as much as I can, but I, I will, and, and they will be different lengths of how long I spend, because I have no idea what I'm going to say or anything, so I kind of teach the way I write, which I have no idea what's going to happen next. But I love um, trying to use the critiques to, to point out a few things as we go as well. So um, uh, anyway, I want to do, first thing I want to do is a little uh, exercise. And um, this one is about how to get in touch with the creative part of you, which does not live in your brain, uh, in my opinion. Everything I'm saying is just my opinion, so, you know, I don't have any proof of this. But your brain, to me, my brain, is like a laptop, a hard drive. It's a wonderful thing. It's just the most advanced computer possible. Um, and you can write a song based on what you have inside your hard drive, assuming you have things in there all your memories, everything that's ever happened to you. If you could access all that, and you had read every book on songwriting there was, you could write a pretty decent song from that. Um, I don't know if it would be as good as the song you would write from going online. So if you think of the creative flow is when you, when you got wireless and you have access to everything from this. It still has to go through this. And that's the most amazing thing, like when you come up with a line, I notice the minute I come up with a line, my ego immediately claims ownership. Look what I just did, you know, and I just watch it and go, that's very sweet. Thanks for sharing that. That's really good. Because I secretly believe that I have nothing to do with it as far as the stuff that comes down the pike from the creative flow. The only thing I have to do with it is keeping the hole in the top of my head open and keeping my heart from being too clumped down from whatever life disappointment, not getting enough money for being a songwriter, you know, you name it. Anything about the music business, the feeling of competition, sense of doom, the sense of futility. I have all those feelings, even though I've had some success. They don't go away, by the way, so the best thing you can do is learn how to ride through them. So sometimes I come in and my head is too big for the rest of the song. You know, I just don't really want my head to write the song. I want to go through it and around it and and use that huge amount of options of possibilities and, and take what comes through and then work, it, work with it and use my intellect at that point and all the craft that I've learned. But I don't want to do it without that because it just isn't the same. It's not, you don't get the great lines to me. So here's a great little exercise to do. If you've never thought about this before, um, it might sound like I'm just talking craziness here. So. Um, most people actually live, you know, identify more with the thought and things like that. And this exercise is one that hopefully tries to bypass that for just a second. And I'm not going to explain it too much because I think it really only works the first time. And then your brain figures it out. <laughs> All right. So just um, now one thing is that you have eyeballs and eyelids, right? Well, you have in, in our imagination, let's imagine we have another set of eyelids on the inside of your eyelids. That's your inner sight, your sort of your intuition. 
So if you were to close your eyes and then just close your eyes and imagine yourself opening your inside eyes and you don't have to see anything, just do this exercise, just close your eyes and just flat practice opening those inside eyelids with your imagination just to give you a feel for it because it's a little crazy and weird. Okay, so now with your outside eyes closed, I want you to reach into this pocket that's right in front of your heart. Just, just physically reach in there with your hand and you're going to grab something that's there and you're going to pull it out and keeping your outside eyes closed, but open your palm of your hand and with your inside eyes, open those eyelids and look in the palm of your hand and the very first thing that pops into your mind, just keep, keep a note of that. Okay, you can open all your eyelids now. What did anybody see? Doesn't have to be a big answer. Doesn't have to be a turtle. Very interesting. Doesn't have to be interesting. A turtle. Anybody? A sheep? A, a sheet of paper? Sheath? Oh, a whole bunch of paper. Okay, sounds like a bunch of songs. I want to be. Yes, in the back? A heart? Wow. That's very cool. Yeah, Rasheen? Ah, yeah. A little seashell. Yeah. A circle? Like a circle, was it, was it made out of anything? Okay, and then after you look at, you ask what was it? And the next question is, what temperature was it? Which is a totally weird question, yeah. But it had to have been some temperature, so then you go, if I knew what, and if somebody says I don't know, you say, well, if you did know, what would you say it was? Because the brain is the thing that says, I don't know. I don't have enough information. I don't like this game. This is stupid. This is crazy crap, right? And it's, it's really a childlike game. It's not, there's no bad answer. I had somebody open up there and she got really upset because she didn't see anything. And I said, well, nothing is something. It's, it's how you work with that, you know? And it doesn't, there is, in my opinion, that thing that you saw was delivered to you not from your brain. Unless you've done this exercise before and you were like, okay, I'm gonna think of something really cool this time. Because if you do it two or three times, your brain will definitely start planning ahead. Because it loves to do that, it just loves to do that. It's like a big puppy dog that just wants to be right. So instead of pushing it away or making a negative reaction to my brain, which is, believe me, so noisy, it's unbelievable, and opinionated. I just try to, I try to coax it along and just let it, just let it feel like it's always involved. And I'd say thank you for sharing and all that stuff. And also, you know, I do things like I trick myself. Like if I'm going to go in my writing room, I'll bring a pot of tea and I'll pour a cup of tea and put it in the corner and give it to my fear and let's set my fear right over there. My fear of not being able to do it or, you know, not being able to be good enough. And I'll take my my noisy know-it-all critique kind of guy you know that wants to just finish the song like in two hours and and I'll just set him over there with a people magazine or you know just give him some tea and a magazine and, and, I, and I basically invite these parts of myself to in, to interrupt me as much as they want because the minute you say don't interrupt me then what's gonna happen so you just go make as much noise as you like I'll be over here at my piano don't be offended if I don't pay any attention to you and I don't know, there's something about that exercise that just gets me free to be kind of free floating. And things pop out and I record them and I don't even hear what I did until like maybe the next day I go back and listen to it and I go, I love that little bit, you know. <clears throat> so try that as a, a different kind of thing and a different way to jump into it. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to do another song because I wanted to tell you about this other song that if you were to say, you know, what was my biggest hit? Um, it, it would depend on what kind of hit you were talking about. Um, this kiss, definitely, I would say, financially, definitely my biggest hit. But there are other kinds of songs that maybe weren't even singles, that I might have might be on somebody's album or tucked away somewhere, um, that are songs that just touch people. And they find their way to people word of mouth sometimes. And gift to get an, in my inbox to get a letter from somebody who say, you know, who might have heard a song like, like this one that I'm going to play and that said, you know, this one helped me more than anything to get through this difficult time. And, and I mean, this song, this is a song that I wrote after my husband died in 1994. And it's, um, 
it's one that I didn't even think I would take out of my house, really. I thought it was just too personal. And the first person I played it for was Rodney Crowell, who said, you are not only taking this out of your house, but you're going to hear back from people for the rest of your life who get to hear this song. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm not, you know. And when I wrote some of the lines that are really the most poetic lines, I had no idea what I just wrote down. Because it took me two weeks to figure out what that line meant. And then all of a sudden I was like, wow, that's really good. And I, I, I sound like I'm bragging about my own song, but I'm not bragging because I had nothing to do with it. I just, was, I just you know, happened to be a cracked open grieving widow woman who, who, who a song, the song just came through perfectly written. So this is what I love about writing, is that that can happen to anyone. Anyway, I'll play this one too, because this is really my biggest hit. <laughs>
gone by Thank you. All right, so are there, are there any questions before I start calling on people? Yeah. Called Sand and Water. Ah, uh, me. <laughs> it's actually been covered once by an Australian artist uh, named Nyanel. And um, believe it or not, I mean, I, I would have uh, hoped it would be covered more, but um, it was performed by Elton John. That's true. I, that, that was not a bad idea. Um, <laughs> Interestingly enough, back in 1997 um, is when the record was released. My husband passed away in 94. And many songs on the album Sand and Water, many songs, uh, not I should say about four or five of them, I had written up to a certain point in the song and didn't know what I was writing about. I mean, I thought I was writing one about maybe if my parents passed away. And I mean, I just was, I knew that it felt like somebody was leaving. And I remember playing them for my husband, like when in the first couple of... Um, like verse and chorus. Um, this one I wrote after he died, but um, you know, ter just in relating back to the, the the way that this creative spirit, this creative flow, already knows. I mean, I, it's really synonymous with with God. With my, you know, I don't think there's any difference. And I think there's a, a way that sometimes art and and writing and painting and all sorts of things like that come before their time, and even. For me, you know, actually writing half the songs before my husband was even diagnosed with cancer, um, I would play them for him, and he'd be like, "I love that one." Now he, there was one that he called it the Bob Dylan song because it had this sort of Bob Dylan vibe to it, and he would just say, "You know, finish that one, finish that one, finish that one," and you know, I'd be like, "Ah, oh, you know, I don't know what I'm writing. I don't know where it's coming from." And so after he was going through this very long 18 months of being very ill, and I remember him saying, I know what those songs are about. You know, like, uh, it's so crazy, you know, but it was true. And so when, when I went in the studio to record the record, Rodney Crowell, who is a good friend of ours, um, co-produced it with me. And, and it came out in 97, and right about that time, ironically, it was right about the time Diana died, and, and then Versace died, and then Mother Teresa died. And there was all this stuff going on in, in the world about grief. And um, so Elton called me out of the blue one day and asked me if I would rewrite the third verse. And uh, I was so thrilled. I mean, I thought somebody was playing a trick on me at first. I was like, who is this really? You know? <laughs> and I remember saying, oh, absolutely. When do you need to buy? You know, no problem. I can do that. I can do that. <laughs> you know? And here the song was so, sort of written from such a deep place. Um, he said, well, in three weeks I'll be rehearsing in Atlanta. Why don't you drive over from Nashville and bring it to me? And I'm like, awesome. So I'm like, I'm working my tail off between those. Couldn't come up with anything, like for three weeks. I'm literally sweating bullets driving to Atlanta going, please God, please God, please God. Come on, I got two more exits, you know. And the exit before the rehearsal hall, I got a couple of lines that worked, you know. I mean, they weren't like, but they worked. And he liked them. And I was just, thank you, thank you, thank you. And the irony was he wanted me to take out a line about raising my son alone. And uh, back then, you know, he didn't have any kids and he was never going to have any kids. So it just shows you how much the world has changed. But um, now he could sing it the way it is. He didn't actually record it, but he did, um, he did sing it. And I got to hear him sing it. And he just, you know, Elton John singing your song, it just doesn't get any more wildly great than that. Because how many songs does he cover? Like, I think he's covered a few, but I mean, I was like, that's like not even my song anymore. He makes, he sounded like an Elton John song. It was really great. So much fun. Anyway, I want to, um, I want to bring up um, a young lady who, not, not to torture you or anything because, uh, <laughs> um, no, I don't mean that. I'm, I'm just saying, I, uh, I taught a workshop in Nashville called the Stargazer and I did this um, sort of a reach out to the, to the songwriters and said, send me a song and, you know, if, if, if it gets in the top slot or the second slot, I'll give you I'll give away two scholarships. So um, uh, this young lady from Northern Ireland, uh, who's w with me here today, um, she won it. She won the scholarship. And she, she was working at a Boots pharmacy and had always obviously been a musician, but hadn't really pursued her music full time. So thanks to me, she's never gone back to Boots. Um, but no, I've, I've loved her music very much. And I would, I, bec I, because of you know 
all of us being here in this workshop sort of environment, I wanted to to have her put her on the spot and have her come up and play a song for you, and then we'll settle we'll settle down into all the critiques we can get between now and the end. Ruth, would you come up and play a song? Um, and this this is the lesson in this is you know don't be afraid to reach out, don't be afraid to send things. I know it becomes really daunting. And it's good to find out how to send things and who to send them to, and all that's really important because otherwise you don't want to waste your time. But you know, if she had just thought, "Well, I won't win that, I won't get that," you know, and then from that, you know, I've completely um, kidnapped her from her life, and she's come out on a few tours with me, and she's a fantastic musician all around. But uh, anyway, you ready? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Tremble, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I honestly did not know this was going to happen, or I would have at least put a little makeup on or something, especially when there's a camera right there. I'm oh, supposed I, I to forgot be to tell you, I've made her become my road manager, too, uh, so she's in her road manager outfit. So. Yeah, this is a road <laughs> manager outfit. I'd never be caught dead in this at home. <laughs> um, you goodbye? Whatever you feel like. Well, Beth likes this one, so, you know, you I'm not going to shoot myself in the foot and do one she's going to tear apart. be back there uh, s selling some CDs uh, if y'all want to buy any then we're just which I will be happy to sign um, but I just wanted to know you know the the fantastic songwriter and artist that she is just you never know you know as you know <laughs> wait that's the song you never know you know as you know 
Well, you certainly could write about the image, but I mean, for me, it's it's um, it, it's to it's to practice the muscle. There's a muscle that you can develop for bypassing your brain, which is really what you want to do. Um, to just and believe me, your brain's not going to be far away. You're not going to you're not going to forget how to think. But if you can get your brain, that one of the one of the things you know, meditation is something people talk about as a great way to have more clarity. And what is meditation except it calms your brain? You know, you give your brain a mantra or you give it something to think about, like your breath, and, and you're tricking your brain into concentrating. You're getting it out of your way for what? For this other thing. And I know that when I meditate regularly, I make better decisions. I have better sense of what to do. And, you know, like all the stuff of life just seems like I can, okay, I got it, you know. And so that exercise is it's an easy one to get people sort of in touch with a sort of a playful game. And try it a lot. I mean, I do it two or three times in a row, and I'm always amazed at, you know, the muscle is like not having your brain try to, uh, let me turn this real quick. Well, let's see. Oh, well, there may be some. Uh, Ruth, do you know how to get my mail program not to go boink when, um, when an email comes in? Okay, never mind. You playing guitar, Pat? Yeah. That's killer. You sure you don't want to play that live? Come on. <laughs> Come on. It's I'm I've been staying out all night. The lights are out on Main Street and the drunks are picking fights. I can hear the devil singing, almost petrifies my soul. I'm leaving in the morning, I'm going home. I'm working in the city a thousand miles away. Too many busy people always getting in my way. Standing on the sidewalk, I never sat so down. I'm leaving in the morning, I'm going home. This sense of isolation nearly driving me insane My independence falters and I hardly know my name I'm crying in this empty church over all the things I've done I'm leaving in the morning, I'm going home Wow To the window to my room It just goes to remind me Of all the ways that I want you And the memory of your sweet voice Almost cuts me to the bone I'm leaving in the morning I, I'm leaving in the morning I, I'm leaving stuff that's totally you know I mean most of the song is right there the only thing I feel is that I don't know why anything right. and it doesn't it doesn't mean you have to write a whole book and tell me everything about everything but 
It's 2 a.m. on Sunday. I've been staying out on my... Okay, that's good. Life's wrong. Out on Main Street and the drunks are picking fights. Great visuals. I can hear the devil singing. Almost petrifies my soul. I'm leaving in the morning. I'm going home. So this is all happening at night. Night before mm -hmm. you're leaving in the morning. I'm working in the city a thousand miles away. You're talking in general. Too many busy people always getting in my way. Okay, way and way. That's okay. <coughs> Way, way, okay. But it would be better, yeah. you know? Okay. It would be better okay. if it wasn't way and way. Okay. Because, I mean, a way and my way are the same rhyme. So I'd play around. I'd, I'd open that little piece back up and just see, like, open up the hem and see if you can find another A rhyme okay. one way or the other. Uh, standing on the sidewalk, I never felt so damned alone. Okay, so now he's, it's at night and he's standing on a sidewalk. No, what it is is four, it's four different vignettes, so... I'm sorry, but late at night. There are no cliff notes allowed. So. I know. <laughs> so how do we know? Yeah, that's a different. That's a different scene. So. Well, this yeah. one of the you know what I'd looked for in different songs to critique would be to to pull it to pull out one thing that's really important to remember. Okay. okay so. Okay. If you're talking to someone, you can't change who you're talking to unless you include that in somehow in the <laughs> lyric of the song in a way that's not too, you know, she said or you know sometimes she said works great, but. You, you can't just suddenly be talking to, say, you, 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 and then she, 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 you know. And another one is, if you've moved to another address. Okay. Like, for instance, you're saying, it's 2 a.m. on Sunday. I've been staying out all night because it's nighttime. Um, there's this stuff happening around you. And in the morning, you're going home. That's all I know from this first verse. I'm working in the city a thousand miles away. That means to me, right away, I'm not, I, I don't think you're standing on the street corner and working in the city at the same time you're telling me about hey I work in the city a thousand miles away as you're still there in the same spot from yeah. the first verse right too many busy people always getting in my way standing on this sidewalk what side that's the, that's the first puckered seam in the song a puckered seam is where you've got this lovely line and all of a sudden there's this like wait a minute my brain couldn't go forward because I was going what sidewalk what's this sidewalk which sidewalk is this sidewalk do you know Away, so, so could that's, be any city, any town, whatever. Okay, when you say I'm standing on this sidewalk, you're this person singing me this song, and you're singing me the song, and you can't go anywhere, really. Okay, can't go anywhere, ever, <laughs> okay. in the song, unless you do the first part of the song talking about later on. I mean, it had. You can prove me wrong, but I've yet to hear a song where you can suddenly change and be in another place, unless it's clued in somehow in the lyrics. So you just, if you're going to be standing on this sidewalk, I don't think that's as important of a line as to, I love the idea of this person's, I, I love the, I'm working in the city and all that, too many busy people. Um, standing on the sidewalk, I never felt so damn alone. Why can't that sidewalk be the same sidewalk at night where you're leaving in the morning? Is that possible? Yeah. Because yeah. there's nothing that says it's not. Right? No. So until you told me that, was, that wasn't the same place, uh, you don't even have to change it then. As long as you don't argue with me. Because you're standing <laughs> on the sidewalk. <laughs> it's 2 a.m. on Sunday. We're going to do that. You're standing on the sidewalk, and then you're leaving in the morning. Okay, yeah, okay. so we, now we know that. Okay. And we now know that you work in a city a thousand miles away. And who are these people? Too many busy people always getting in my way. Are they the people that are the drunks picking fights? Just the throngs, you know, when you're away, if you're, this is sort of, the idea behind the song is there was a lot of emigration in Ireland, so people went away to work and found themselves work, but sometimes isolated, oh, and wow. in the middle of the throngs yeah. and feeling. Okay, so you know what, road. that's a great thing to make sure that, that, that there's more of a sense of that in okay. the song. Okay. So, I would, I would say, I don't want to take too much time because it would, it would take too much time but you you need to spend a half a day on the second verse okay and just really i'm talking when i say a half a day i mean write five versions of it don't be afraid to write past it okay take your favorite song ever written of all time by bono or the beatles or whoever your favorite songwriter is and rewrite their second verse as a great exercise because if that won't tear your brain out and stomp it <laughs> nothing will <laughs> I tried to write a second verse of one of my Joni Mitchell songs. I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, I had to go hide in the closet to do it so nobody would hear me. But it's a great exercise because it makes you realize that you can change and pull out the seams and try different things. And okay. just when you think you're done, you've limited where else it could go. You know? 
So that's really great to, oh, sorry, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just yakking away and you're probably not getting any of this on tape. Uh, but I'm pretty loud, so, um, all right, so I'm going to zip through here. Wahoo, I'm leaving in the morning. And that, I would normally say, do a big chorus, but you know, I didn't feel that way. I liked that wahoo. It was, I could sing along Same. with it. It felt, and it felt like it just was the piece of bread on the bottom of the sandwich of the okay. first half. Second verse, this sense of, or second half, this sense of isolation is nearly driving me insane. My independence falters and I hardly know my name. Again, I don't know that this is what the story is. You told me some information. Put that in the song. Because I would, it, then it pops open for me. And you can do it in really subtle ways. You don't have to hit them over the head with it. You can, you don't have to say, in the year da-da-da-da in Ireland, there was a da-da-da-da. You know, you, you, can, you can infer it and you, you'll know how if you've been there and you, um, okay, now, Here's a problem. A uh, last verse. I hear the sound of lovers laughing through the window to my room. Are these lovers in your room laughing through the window and you're still on the sidewalk? <laughs> that's private. <laughs> okay. Because that's what I would assume because you're standing on the sidewalk. It's 2 a.m. and you're leaving in the morning. And now there's people in your room <laughs> laughing through the window. Okay. So I love the window to my room. Yeah. Uh, if you can just get yourself back up the stairs somehow in the song, I don't care, but just you gotta, you gotta, you can take one of the lo lovely young ladies with you, I don't care. It just goes to remind me of all the ways that I want you. Now, ha, huh, suddenly I'm like, who, who is this? So that's one of the most powerful moments in the song. It's way too late in the song before I know there's a you. I would get that you way up there now you know maybe not in the first verse but maybe in the second verse um if you if you let go of the whole sidewalk thing which is not that important if you said it's 2 a.m on sunday i've been staying out all night the lights are out on main street and the drunks are picking fights i can hear the devil sing it almost petrifies my soul i'm leaving in the morning i'm going home i hear the sound of lovers laughing or something through my room it just goes to remind me of all the ways that i want you and the memory of your sweet voice almost cuts me to the bone i'm leaving in the morning i'm going home First two verses right there. One, two. I'm completely waiting to hear what happens with this thing now. See, now I want to know. And then put that person up in the front of the song. Okay. That said, I would do verse, verse, the wahoo, verse, the wahoo. Mm -hmm. And then I would do these lines, but they'd be up there. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe this would end up going down there. You'll have to play with that. I would make okay. a bridge. Just, yeah. Okay. okay. I would, I, it needs another musical thing to yeah. really... Yeah. To go to the next level. So, um, you're in the okay. key of, you just, uh, yeah, you can take that off and all. Okay. And this is just one option. There's a million ways you could do this, right? So, I'm not going to be able to play the guitar the way you did. Sending off into that, you know, and coming back into the chorus of the Wahoo thing. Okay. It, and it doesn't have to be four lines. It can just be two. And it'll be just a nice little, you know, that little thing they bring, the little sherbet thing before you're really full and you think, I can't eat another bite. Oh, a little sherbet thing. And I think I'll have that. And then you're ready for, like, the next course. <coughs> That's a bridge. Okay. okay. Right. Thank you so much. No, sir. Thank you. It's like a dark cloud and it keeps me from going and it holds me back I can't even have a little laugh it stops me from going and I want to cry I can even feel the tears from behind my
Well, there's not a whole lot I can tell you, young lady. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm just so excited to hear you. Uh, especially because, hold on, let me just get untangled from that. You know, you can do a lot of things in the studio these days, and I saw your, I guess, Facebook page or yeah. your, your web page, and I thought, oh, well, you can do a lot of things with Photoshop. But, um, you know, you're very, very talented, and, and you. obviously, young lady. How old are you? I'm 11. You're 11. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> So, Ashley, did you, did you write this song with someone, or did you write no, it by yourself? It was my, my totally own by song. yourself. Yeah. Did anybody help you, like 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 play it for? Like sometimes I'd have a, when I was eleven, I had a lot of mentors. Let me tell you. Um, no, my parents or family aren't musical at all. So. They're not. No. Maybe you came from another planet. <laughs> Wouldn't that make us all feel better? No, <laughs> you're fantastic. I'm sure your parents are extremely proud of you. Um, well, I think you have an amazing songwriting talent and obviously an amazing voice and you've got a gorgeous face to go with it so you got mm -hmm. the whole package Thank you. so my my business word of advice to you is um, because it wouldn't surprise me if people would come at from all over just find you and you could end up on the voice and winning this and that and just going like that and that wouldn't be necessarily bad but um, it's there's no rush uh, I think that some of the most amazingly talented people um, sometimes get sort of, you know, there's so many opportunities that come your way because you, you, they're like, oh my God, this is like amazing. And, and it takes a while. You have great poise, by the way, great stage presence. You seem very comfortable. Um, and I went through phases, like for a little while, I'd be really comfortable and then I'd get uncomfortable for a couple of years. And there was just a lot to learn about the whole thing as I went along. So. Finding really great people, and, and y I'm sure you will, and your parents will probably help you, make sure you have a good team of people around you so that you're not, like, signing away your publishing. And, you know, there's going to be people that are going to go, oh, well, I'll help you, I know everybody, you know. And I signed a really bad deal when I was about 17. Well, my dad signed it for me. And uh, he didn't know. I mean, he, in fact, he didn't want me to sign it. And I was some guy that had a studio in Alabama, and... I said, but daddy, daddy, he knows everybody's going to get me a record deal. And I was, I was actually much older than you. By then I was 17. So, um, and, and I remember my dad said, well, I'm not doing this till I have a lawyer look at it. Well, the only lawyer he knew was a guy that does cattle law. So we went down to Jim Garrett's <laughs> office down there in Montgomery, Alabama. Had some d big steer horns coming out behind his head and on his, you know, in the back wall. And he looked at my contract and said, well, Bob, it... Doesn't look like she has to pay out any money. All he, all, all she does is record her songs, and he gets, he takes them and makes them, you know, whatever. Basically, I gave him all my songs for free for five years, and then another five years option, and he had, he, he I was a slave contract for life, basically. And I took a long time to get out of it. Anyway, so long story short, get some good advice, get a good music attorney, because you're going to need one, because you're going to have a lot of people offering you stuff. Now to the song. Tell me the story. What made you think of the song? What were you thinking when you wrote it? Uh, when I wrote it, it was written about how your anxieties can hold you back. So how your anxieties can hold you back. Yep, yeah. that's very true. And just uh, generally, um, you know, it was as well personal as well, but I like to say that my music is my personal diary and I'll leave pages for other people to write in it as well. So yeah, that's a great way to look at it. Um, so how does somebody who's 11 have a dried up heart? That's that my first question. Because you're, 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 I mean, that's, a, that's something that somebody that's been through a lot of stuff would have. Yeah. So where, where did that image come from to you? Um, well, I thought of it when I 
you know, I've gone through a tough time and, mm -hmm. you know, generally sometimes a lot of people, you know, you hear a lot of stories and they're like, oh, I can't go on. And, you know, generally it's saying, you know, there was a time and there's a tough time and that's uh, how you felt during the time. So when you're talking to you in the song, who is, who is it you Im imagine you're speaking to when you say, you can have me and my dried up heart, but you will never tear my soul apart. I love the way you sing that line. Thank Who is the you in that? Uh, to well, you? first, uh, at the start of the song, there's the dark cloud, and I think everything around me, the everything that's holding me back, that's dragging me in and not not, not letting me out. Uh, oh, I just realized how great that is. You know what? I didn't know who that you was. So, that piece of information. Let me see if I just missed it. It's like a dark cloud, and it keeps me from going, and it holds me back. Guess what? You're talking to me about that. Right? You're saying, it's like a dark cloud, this thing that you're talking about, right? And you're saying, I can't even have a little laugh, and it stops me from running, and I want to cry. I can even feel the tears from behind my eyes. Oh, and then all of a sudden, you're singing to me about that cloud, right? But you're telling me the you is the cloud, mm. right? So one of the most important things, because you can't, then, like, off to the side, stop in the middle of the song, go, okay, now I'm not talking to the person anymore. Now I'm talking to the cloud. And mm. you jump back in the song. Yeah, like, right? everything, like, around you, if someone's going through a tough time, whatever's, you know. I love them. this. I love this idea. But there's only one word that I would change. And I, it might be a perfect song. I hate to say that at 11 years old. <laughs> um, what if you're talking to the cloud the whole time? Because that chorus is really strong. You can have me, and you can have me, but you'll never tear my soul apart. That's very strong. If you're talking to the cloud, so what if you can? What would you change about that first line to address, like, just how would you say instead of "It's like a dark cloud"? What if you were talking directly to it, so that there was this consistency? There was consistent, you know, like it was. You don't stop talking to one person and start talking to another person. Because yeah. that's, that's the only weak point in the song. So like maybe like you're like a dark cloud. There you go. Simple as that. You're like a dark cloud that keeps me from going. Or you are the dark cloud that keeps me from going and holds me back. I can't even have a little laugh. And you stop me from running and I want to cry. I can even feel the tears from behind my eyes. Would you mind singing that verse in the chorus? Just saying like something like the you in the first line and keeping the you? Would you okay. be able to do that? I would just be interested to hear how that sounds. You're like a dark cloud, and you keep me from going. And you hold me back, I can't even have a little laugh. And you stop me from running, and I want to cry. I can even feel the tears from behind my eyes. Yeah. Do you like that? I, I mean, like I that, think yeah. that makes it clearer. Do you guys think it makes it clearer? <laughs> and I'll tell you something else. You ever hear of something called a pet peeve? A pet peeve? That's an American thing, probably. A pet peeve is like something that drives me nuts. You know, like one of the things, you know, there's a whole bunch of songs that it's almost a stylistic thing in a lot of um, types of styles of music to put the accent on the wrong syllable. And that's a different thing. I, I, that doesn't bother me. But in a song where the, the, if you suddenly have a whole bunch of syllables, like this line here, whoops, oh, I almost broke my computer. Um, and, I can even, no, see, and I can even feel that it seemed like that was a, a lot of syllables right in there. Is that just that time when you sang it, maybe? Uh, sing that line, like, and I can even have a little laugh, and it stops me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want to cry. Uh, um, I can't. I can't even have a little laugh it stops me from running And I want to cry I can even ah. yeah. So it's the one to cry I can even yeah. That's what I call a puckered seam Because okay. the melody doesn't really want to do that You're forcing the melody to go And it really wants to go da 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 can that's something I'd work on so that you can have the same syllables there that the melody wants to have. Yeah. You, I won't worry about what it would be. You, you'll figure it out because you're really good. Um, all right, so that would be a little weak spot that I would make really strong because it would it would also help the cadence of it. You wouldn't have this sudden thing where all of a sudden there's this 
sort of backlog of syllables. And then, um, what was the other thing I saw? Oh, the only other thing I would do, and this is really, oh, I know what, I know it was. The, the, the thing that I would try not to do, if, if you're going to stick with dried up heart, and that's a big word, dried up, that's a big word. And it might be interesting. I like it. I do like it. But I think if it were my song, I would try to see how many other, I'd come up with 10 other explanations for the heart besides dried up and see what happens. Because if you open that back up, the rest of the song is really, really good. And you could find somebody that just doesn't like that image. But there may be some of, sometimes I think maybe when I come up with something, I think maybe that's on the way to coming up with something slightly different. That's not to say that if you come, go through that exercise and write 10 of them down and you go, nope, my favorite one is dried apart. Then, then, you, then you've done that exercise, and it'll just make you a better songwriter. So there's nothing wrong with dried apart. But if you do go with dried apart, I wouldn't use the word dried in, in, again okay. in any other place. I think you have to save that word. Um, most of the time, that's the rule for me. But there's always exceptions. Like on this kiss, we go, you can kiss me in the moonlight. You know, we say kiss a lot of times in that song. So it's not a hard and fast rule. But I have to just say... Um, I'm expecting to see you all over the world, mm -hmm. young lady. I'm very, very impressed. That's thank you. Thank you, Ashley. You're fantastic. This is called Light Up. I have no idea about the level. When you start fading away, I'll be closer than today.
on, on the, I forgot on the, cool. Really cool track. Where'd he go? Yeah, really cool track. Now this is a genre I don't write in, you know, I've written a couple of things just where I'm doing the lyric, but I haven't produced the music and I know that it's a very different kind of genre where... Yeah. Yeah. You could. Well, that's the thing. Now, now, if if dance music was um, written so that it was cohesive, and a lot of it is just the same thing over and over and over and over and over. And, and I mean, I love to dance to it, but but I'm not really paying attention as a, to the song. But what amazes me is that more people that write dance music don't don't really attend to the song part more. So that if you just had a guitar, you could still present a song. You know, not that you would do that and put it on a dance floor like that. But there's a lot of song in the song. That's why I, I was drawn to it. And, you know, I'm a sucker for a song. And I don't have any problem with the repetition of it. Melodically, it's very repetitive. Like, you'd never repeat that many phrases over and over again and stop and then start it. You wouldn't do that like in a country song or another style of song. But it's, so it's appropriate for here. But even that said, um, and I know that we were listening to it, and it wasn't it should have been really loud and you know like super clarity and everything. Um, it's uh, it's hard to hear what you're saying some of the time. I don't mind that. No, I don't mind. I was talking about the pronunciation, like being able to hear the word. Um, like, uh, let me see if I can find a little spot here. Uh, I don't know how to look that high, but well. Thank you. Oh, I turned it. <laughs> I could hear. So there's just a couple of places where you say ending and it sounds it's like kind of back in the and again, you know, in this style of music it's not really, you know, really the biggest thing is not the lyric but I love that the lyric is cohesive a couple of things though from the standpoint of just giving it the old eagle eye on the lyric um, when your starlight fades away I'll be closer than today I won't lose this map I hold and I'll keep on searching searching on you know, in my world, I would still rhyme it. Yeah, I know on the text that looks like that doesn't rhyme. Because the phrase is for the new section of the song, that lyric fades out. Oh, okay, maybe I didn't realize that. Right, but even what it's saying is, um, when your starlight fades away, I'll be closer than today. I don't know what that means. This person is using the imagery of going to space as the traveling to the person. So when their light fades away, they'll still be traveling, and they'll be going to the Oh, okay. Well, I... Right. I get, th I get that when you explain it. I didn't get it when it went by. So I don't mind that concept. I think it's a really cool concept. And I would try to make that somehow a little bit clearer, if possible. Um, I mean, it's, it definitely feels like it's all about being way out in space. And there's a lot of cool lines in there that I like um, because it, and it doesn't have to be, you know, really nailed down. It, it, I mean, that's the thing. There's a lot of ways and this is an um, uh, an amazing amount of content for that kind of song you know a lot of the dance songs they just go and baby baby and da 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 da, da and you know over and over and over no i think it's really well done um uh, i was trying to think where the other place was when the light is clear i couldn't yeah. until we light up the sky it's just, there's a, a little bit of a vagueness. I, I mean, I'm wondering if you're, are you talking to somebody, like if they were like a distant star, or yeah, you know, what the story is. I'd
Right. And if I get lost, I hope you'll glow, gravitate me through any storm and gravitate me until I see your face. I mean, there's ways that you're pulling that sort of scientific stuff into relationship, which I think is one of the things that really works for the song really well. Well, I do, there's not a whole lot I have to say that I would change. I would just, I would look at that first verse because the first verse is so important. And anytime I have to go, what did, that, what did he say? What does that mean? I'm not listening to the next line. And that's just me. You know, maybe somebody else would hear it right away. Um, and oh, my favorite part of the song was the bridge in terms of the where it went melodically. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, it took a long time to go there. I, I would actually think about maybe... Of course, I know dance songs have to be very long because people want to dance for a long time, so maybe you could do that bridge earlier and then repeat it or something, or maybe. It may be the catchiest part in a way, and um, well, I don't know, the chorus he thinks pretty catchy too. So I would, you know, the thing I would just suggest is, you know, you don't have anything to lose, you've got that, and that sounds really great, and digging it up and moving things around and making that really the catchiest part. And the story, if you can bring that story forward, um, and not have any lines that have a little, what do you say? What does that mean? Uh, and then in terms of the mix, I personally would love to hear every word you're saying. And I know you have to have a lot of bass and a lot of drums in them, but there's a way, you know, a great dance record, you don't have any trouble understanding the words. Part of that's really just pronouncing a couple of words a little bit more. If I had more time, I, you know, I could give you more specific example. Yeah. Well, I think the vocal's great. There's just a couple of spots where it's swallowed back a little bit into the back. So, oh, here, that's great. Awesome. Yeah. So this is called uh, a miner's life, and it's about the miners in Arigna. Thirteen years old. I work as a man Mining the mountain arena Heaving out sandstone To make an inroad To fill a hutch of coal I lie on my side And feed my lungs dust I pick Hutches I push, paid by the ton when mining the seam. There is no time to dream. My life's been spent in the rignal tunneling in to the black. You won't see what lies. Like in a rig, not a scene, the tools, the history of men, not walking but stooping, in four by four foot, me back's cut from bending again, twelve yards north. Black in the light 
So that is just, uh, you know, pulls me in, and yet I'm lost in it, and lost in a good way and lost in not a great way, because I want to connect with so much that's in this song, and so so much that's in this song was probably, if you lived in a Rigna, you'd be like, oh yes, I know what that is, I know what that is. So and that doesn't mean you have to explain everything in a song, but the first part, I think, is it's very compelling, and... I'm trying to be um, careful how I say this because it may just be something I don't understand from the from the sense of where it goes melodically, and it, there may be an entire kind of writing and style of an Irish lament and things that that does certain things that I'm just not accustomed to. So I don't want to fit that into a little box that's over here that fits exactly like that. That said, I know you know some of, a lot of the Irish music I've heard has more of a, a bit of a shape and a form that where I where there's a section and then it goes to this section and it comes back back to, to that section and after you've heard the song once or twice you can kind of feel where it's going you can even feel where it's going the first time you hear it mm -hmm. and the experience that I had first of all I, I love your voice just absolutely beautiful it's just piercingly just stays in this beautiful centered place that I think is lovely. Um, there's a, a couple of ways that just from the sense of like when you're singing where, where you're using more of your speaking voice, which most of the time you are, it's just completely crystal clear. And there's a couple of times where it drops back a little bit back into the back of your throat. Mm -hmm. And um, the sound gets to be the star instead of the words. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I've done this for years where I try to remember not to let the sound of my voice lead. I, I let the I let the what I'm talking, it's, like, it's almost like using more of your speaking voice. Not, I'm not talking about tonally, I'm just talking about in the pronunciation. It's very relaxed kind of thing. I'm not talking about doing over, like pronouncing it more, but just coming from that place of, um, you know, I'm not walking but stooping in four by four foot. And, you know, if one were singing it back, which this isn't going to be not the way you're saying it, but an overstatement of what I'm talking about. If some people could sing, I'm not walking, you know, like, you can tell the difference when somebody's voice is forward and, and back. Um, and, and I just noticed that a couple of times, but I don't really need to dwell on it. You're a fantastic singer. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, no, I'm not talking about projection. I'm talking about the difference between um, singing, trying to sing, and, and you're not an example of this at all. You're a fantastic singer. Most of the time, almost 100% of the time, you're singing with your speaking voice. It's as if she was talking to you on pitch and rhythm. So the consonants and the tone of the voice stay consistent across, pretty much. Um, Ashley also had a fantastic sort of thread of her voice. Even when she would really belt out a note, she stayed in the center of her voice. And that's a whole other, I, could, I, I love talking about that. That could be a whole other workshop I could do on the voice because uh, it's a very important part of learning how to sing your songs. Even if you didn't want to be a performer, if you just want to sing your songs for the person who's doing the demo as a songwriter, it's, it's a really important thing to get your speaking voice to be uh, what you sing with. But going back to the song, I just want to, um, would you sing the first verse and then sing... Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, here's here's the thing. I mean, part of part of what I'm struggling with is that there's the the first chorus and the second chorus. Are, it feels like the melody changes throughout the song, and just kind of ramble rambles into new territory. And there are lots of lovely choices you make melodically, but without a touchstone, it's like you went on. You just went in your closet and you put on every dress you got. You know, and they all look great. I did. <laughs> that actually looks really good. <laughs> it even matches my guitar strap. Um, but there's a coherence. If it, if it works, I don't care what rule it breaks, right? But I'm, I'm compelled, you know, there's some great lines in here like, I lie on my side and feed my lungs dust. Um, there's so much that, that pulls me in. 13 years old, I work as a man, 
mining the mound, mountain Arigna, is that mm -hmm. how you say it? Um, leaving out, heaving out sandstone to make an inroad to fill a hutch of coal. Um, I lie on my side and feel, feed my lungs dust. I pick, I hack, the hutches I push, paid by the ton when mining the seam. There is no time to dream. Well, could you just sing that much again, just so I can get my head wrapped back around it? old I work as a man mining the mountain arigna perfect so far Go ahead. heaving out sandstone to make an inroad to fill a hutch of coal I'm really working on my speech Oh, no, no, don't worry about that. No, you sounded great before. Now, here, here's, I'm going to interrupt you because you did this beautiful thing where you, you served this, this ball over the net. And I was there with my racket, and I was ready to hit it back to you over the net with my soul. I knew that second half was going to just kill me. But the first half, then you went, I loved the, what happened, leaving us on stone. And then this melodically just went, to Kansas and ran out of gas or something. It just yeah, it just I, went. It, we 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 went. Where are we? Wait a minute. Hold on. I'm in a closet. I thought I was heading down a hallway. Mm. That's how I felt. That's how. Yeah. I was, and if, I wouldn't even bother you about this if I didn't love this song so much and want it to be all the way what it wants to be. And that's me sounding very grandiose. I know, but mm. I'm just speaking as your devil's advocate now. There's a great song in here, like that. Gillian Welsh would be like, darn. I wish I'd written that. And it's just all in there, but there's there's a few there's a few detours that if you don't make if you really mm. pull a structure together, get the best of the best. Can you sing that again? Just bear with me, because I want to see if I can be a little bit more clear. Thirteen years old, yeah. Thirteen years old, I work as a man. That should be to me. The second half go da 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 da. If you've written Danny Boy, don't be afraid to sing it twice. <laughs> oh, you mean so? <laughs> That's what my heart cry. I mean, this is the songwriter me going. <gasps> now, if what if you? S but sing that next line the way you mm. have it already. It may just be the very last part. Yeah, I think it's also the chord because I did it on the mandolin and I haven't. Oh, that's I fine. I have Yeah, it's, it sounds much better on the mandolin. I just can't find no the worry. equivalent. That's okay. But you did it in the first I, half, actually. Yeah, uh, I think the chord that's used there, that crazy chord there, it, it sounds really, really nice on the mandolin. It just sounds absolutely completely crap on the guitar, no matter what. Well, whatever chord you're playing is not the same chord as no, what I'm talking about. Yeah, in, in okay. this, from the well, so, so just do the second half for a second. Okay. Let me just bear with me. Just bear with me. Heaving, all right. Heaving out sandstone to make an inroad to fill a hutch of coal. It's my I've all it is to me. All it is that that that's a beautiful chord. I, I can hear that it yeah. would be more beautiful on a mandolin. <laughs> to to fill uh, a hutch of coal. Would you not want to go back to the? To the one chord, to the original chord. Mm -hmm. I can't in my head. Hold on. What is it? Just okay. Sing "Mining the the Mountain Arigna." Mountain Arigna. What chord is that on Arigna? Arigna. E minor. E minor. Arigna. Right. If you put that right here, I promise okay. you, there will not be a dry eye in the house. I promise you. Uh -huh. Don't let me down, people. All right. So just go. To finish of coal. Thank you. Okay. You see, it does come. It, no, comes. No, no, it has to come there. It does have to no, come. it has okay, to. Okay. It's like your mama not being on time when she picks you up from school. She's got to be there when the when the All bell right, rings. So. That not going to that one chord there yeah. took something that was so transporting me, and then I went, huh, huh, and then okay, sing me the next section because there's some great stuff here too. I lie on my side and feed my lungs dust. I pick, I hack the 
much as I push Made by the ton when mining the seam There is no time to dream I would go, I would go back I was, there was no time to dream And then go up to the Yep, yep I mean, it just seems like a really pesty thing probably like what is she talking about? And I, I don't know. All I'm saying is, mm. for me, there's a passionate history of song and writing. And if you look at, you know, the just back in time, there are these touchstones. And that would be a touchstone that I think to not put that in there takes it to a place of, of missing mm. a, an incredible okay. opportunity. Now, this is all just my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Somebody else could go, well, I don't know what she was talking about. It was great before, don't change it. And you might even feel that way. And anything I say is just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it, it's just got so many things going for it. And I wish I had more time. I'd like to just torture you throughout the rest of the song. But um, because there's some really great stuff, and I wouldn't change a thing. And then there's a couple of other spots like that where mm -hmm. I, would, I would try to, to bring it, give them what their what their ears are going you know there's a reason yeah. certain chords go you know mm. like if you go yeah no i hear you if you're like in this key no rules that are mm -hmm. that there are no s exceptions to but I just want to encourage you to go listen to like some I mean you probably already have all through your life but th the, the the structure of things in in a song like this would really bringing more structure into it not having it change like having a verse melody a very definite and then a chorus melody and then a verse melody and, and the words are fantastic and you know, your voice is just, it kills me. It's really amazing. So thank you. Thank well, you. Thank you. I knew that I wouldn't get to uh, as many as I wanted, but um, and I'm and I'm sorry. It's very hard for me just to critique a song really, really fast, because they, they're to me each one is just like a precious gift, and and um, I'd love to come back and do this again. And I promise I'd I'd uh, I'd be happy to critique more. Um, oh oh yeah, I'm supposed to tell you that uh, that Ruth is back in there. If you guys do want a CD, there's no pressure, obviously, but. Um, I have a couple of, C I've got some CDs here tonight, and oh, I know what I'm, that you're, you're telling me. Yes, um, there's an iPad in the back, and I would love to, um, if you would like to be on my mailing list, I'd love for you to pop in your email, and if you've already sent me a song, um, that's great, but I don't want to presume that you want to hear my newsletters or whatever, so uh, if you would take a minute and just uh, put your put your email in there, and then I'll, uh, I'll be sending out I newsletters and various workshops and stuff that I'm, that I'm doing. Um, and I'm so sorry I couldn't get to more songs. I mean, there's just I have like 12 more that I was like, don't forget to do this one. <laughs> um, but you guys are so, there's so much talent in this room. And um, I want to leave you with, you know, one thing to just to encourage you that uh, it's some of the most powerful writing that you could ever do is when you show up and nothing happens. And you're going to probably think I'm crazy. You know, a lot of people say, well, I just sat there for two hours and I didn't, come with, uh, I didn't come up with anything good. But if you sat there for even a half an hour and you show up and you're willing and, you, and you're open to whatever comes through and nothing happens, that is like lifting 3,000 pounds in the gym of creativity. You're actually working a muscle. That is, th that's the most intense workout you can have is when nothing's happening. It's really easy to write when stuff's going on and you're going, yeah, you know. Um, but those days when I don't have anything just popping, you know, and I put in the time, you know, the next day I'll be trying to go to the grocery store and the whole second verse will just pop through my head. And it's because I put in those hours. It's because I did the time, you know. Um, 
I want to end with a song because that's what we do. <laughs> and uh, this is a song that uh, took me three months to write, literally every day, pretty much day and night. I had, um, I had, um, I'd had my first hit in Nashville uh, called Strong Enough to Bend, which I wrote with a fantastic songwriter named Don Schlitz, who wrote On a Warm Summer's Evening. He, I think Don has come here, has he not? Don's come here? He's a trip. Well, Don and I got together and wrote a song called Strong Enough to Bend that was a hit for Tanya Tucker. And lucky for me, it was going to number one right about the time that Willie Nelson was recording a record. And uh, he just didn't happen to be writing a lot, and he had a deadline. So he heard that song on the radio, and he called up his producer, Fred Foster, who's an, a legend in his own right, and said, find out who wrote that thing and get him to write me something. I don't know if they ever called Don Schlitz, but... He called me and said, would I write a song for Willie Nelson? And I was like, are you kidding? It was an incredible thing. And um, I got the title first, which for me is just kiss of death. Because my brain then starts to take over and go, well, now I think now that we have the title, I know exactly what this song has to be. And, and all my inspirational stuff that I've been talking about, that childlike thing, you know, every time I'd go like this and I'd, my brain would be going, now here's what needs to happen, you know. So it was hard to write the song. Plus... There aren't that many things that rhyme with now, and uh, the way it's structured is the ow is at the end. Anyway, the first time I heard it on the radio, um, I, was r I ran through a stop sign because I was so excited, <laughs> and I got a ticket. Um, and the cop was like, "Ma'am, you're gonna have to turn that, gonna have to turn that down." I'm like, I can't. That's my song. It's Willie Nelson. But I paid for it with my royalties. It was fine. <laughs> It went to number one, and uh, it's one of my favorite songs I've ever had somebody record. And it's on this new record I've been over here promoting. It's called Uncovered. And all the songs on this record are songs that have been recorded by other artists, but I've never put my own version out. So it's been kind of interesting. A lot of these songs are really country because I've had some success in that market, but this one's uh, a lot of fun. It's called Nothing I Can Do About It Now. of real good reasons for all the things I've done and a picture in the back of my mind of what I've lost and what I've won I survived every situation knowing when to freeze and when to run and regret is just a memory written on my brow and there's nothing I I've held my price through every deal I've seen the fire of a woman scorn Turn her heart of gold to steel I've got the song and the voice inside me Set to the rhythm of the wheel And I've been dreaming like a child Since the cradle broke the bow And there's nothing I can do changes, going through the stages, coming around the corners in my life, leaving doubt to faith, staying out too late, waiting for the moon to say good night, <laughs> and I could cry for the time I've wasted, but that's a of time and tears and I know just what I'd change if I went back in time somehow but there's nothing I
waste of time and tears And I know just what I'd change If I went back in time somehow But there's nothing I can do about it now So I'm forgiven everything that forgiveness will allow Cause there's nothing I can do Thank you guys so much. Go write songs.